scientists, welcome back. I'm Jessica Power, one of the curriculum coordinators at Kansas City Public Schools. Last week we spent some time talking about energy. We talked about the effects of sunlight and how the sun actually makes surfaces warm up. This week we're gonna change gears a little bit. We're gonna talk about life science, specifically about traits. Traits are just characteristics that living organisms have that make them unique. For example, I have blue eyes. I'm five foot seven. I have blonde hair. Well, technically it's brown. I have a size eight shoe. Those are traits. They're characteristics about me. What are some characteristics that are unique about you? Do you have brown hair? Do you have blonde hair? Do you have dark, dark brown hair? Do you have brown eyes? Do you have blue eyes? Do you have green eyes? Do you have red hair? Do you have curly hair? Do you have straight hair? How tall are you? What color is your skin? What does your face look like? What does your nose look like? What shape is your eyes? All of these are traits. They're characteristics. Now we as humans, we get our traits from our parents. Just like animals and plants in this world. Did you know plants actually have parents and offspring? Offspring, what are offspring? Offspring are the babies of the parents. So that's gonna be our focus today. We're gonna to talk about traits of organisms or living things. We're gonna identify traits of living things. We're gonna talk about how does parents and offspring have similar, but not the same, traits. And finally, I have a guest star for you today. Special guest. She runs around my house all day, nonstop. And so I wanted to allow you some practice identifying traits by looking at our special guest. We'll get to her in a little bit. First and foremost, last week you probably noticed my assistant, Fred. Fred just hangs out in the background. Fred is a model of a human skeleton. That's right. Underneath your skin, underneath your muscles, you look similar to this. Maybe a little shorter, maybe a little taller, who knows? So a model is just a replica or a structure that's the same as the real one. So for example, our bones are made of calcium. They're made of really, really hard minerals. Fred, his are made of plastic. These are just molds. Have you ever made cookies and used cookie cutouts? Right, and so if you want the cookie cutout to be in the shape of a heart or a star or a circle, that's what it comes out. Think of that as a mold. Maybe you've seen an ice cube tray before, right? So you put water into the tray and that makes little ice cubes. That's also a mold. So what happened was Fred was created from a mold of a human body. Now you'll see there's different screws in Fred, different metal parts. And these metal parts represent his joints or areas that he can move in. So Fred's shoulder can move just like our shoulder can move. His wrist can move just like ours can move. Unfortunately, I have to move his for him. So Fred will be with us during all of our videos this year. Hang out, Fred. Let's go back to traits. So I said earlier that traits were characteristics of living organisms. They're characteristics of living things. I gave you the example of my eyes. I have blue eyes. My skin, I have semi-pale white skin. My hair is kind of curly, wavy, mostly straight, kind of a mess on <laughs> normal days if I don't curl it. What characteristics do you have? Think about that. Can you name three characteristics or traits that you have that are similar to your parents? Okay, we're gonna take a look at some animals today. Okay, now these are just pictures to start off with, but we're gonna be looking at a parent and an offspring. We're gonna take a look at what does the parent look like and compare that to the offspring. What does the offspring look like? We're gonna find characteristics, traits, that are the similar between the two. So the first one I have for you today is a Dalmatian. If you take a look at our Dalmatian, we have a mom Dalmatian, whoops, and we have a baby Dalmatian or a pup. 
Let's take a look. I'll give you a couple seconds. Do you see any traits that are similar between the pup and the mom Dalmatian? Let's look. You may have noticed spots. The mom Dalmatian has black spots on her body. The puppy does have spots as well. They're not as dark, but the puppy and the mom share a similar trait of spots. What else do you see that's similar? I see their noses. Here's the mom's nose. It's mostly dark with a little bit of pink. And I see the puppy's nose, mostly dark with a tiny bit of pink. That means their nose, that trait, is similar between the two. Now, do you see a trait that's different? Hmm. Well, first, I notice that the mom is wearing a collar and the puppy is not. But that's not a trait. That's just an accessory, right? A trait is something that comes from within. It comes from our DNA or our genetics. So it's something that our parents, our mom and our dad, pass on to us. Or in this case, the mom and dad Dalmatian pass on to the baby Dalmatian. One trait that I notice is different between the mom and the baby is the ears. If you notice, the mom's ears are mostly black, but the baby's ears are mostly white. So that's a trait that's different between the mom and the pup. Should we try another animal? I was thinking so too. Let's take a look at penguins. Does anybody like penguins? I like penguins. Okay, so taking a look at our penguins, here's a penguin father and it's chick or baby penguin. Now, do you notice any traits or characteristics that are similar between the father penguin and the chick? Hmm. Well, I notice that right here around the head of the penguin, its neck area, is a very dark color. And that's the same for the father penguin. So they have similar traits. Something else that I notice are their feet. They both have webbed feet, very dark colored feet. So they share similar traits. Hmm, let's take a look. I notice their beaks. Their beaks are both very pointy. That long beak probably had, helps them catch krill or the food they eat. So their beaks are similar. Do you notice anything different or do you know something that's different about chick penguins and, their, and the adult penguins? If you're able to see closely, you may notice that the chick is covered in really fluffy feathers. Whereas the adult penguin looks to be more smooth. An adult penguin still has feathers, but those feathers are just smaller, shorter, and really, really close together to help keep them warm. Whereas the baby penguin has a lot more fluffier feathers and over time will lose those feathers. Ready for another animal? Okay. This is another animal that lives in a really cold place. A polar bear. Now, a polar bear, polar bear mother, and her two cubs, okay? Or baby polar bears. Do you see any characteristics or traits that are similar between both? Any traits that are similar between the mother polar bear and the two baby polar bears. I see lots of traits. The first one that stands out to me are their ears. If you see their ears, they're all the same shape. They're similar in size compared to their body. So they share their ears as a trait. 
Something else that I noticed that's similar is their mouths and their nose. So the mouth, the nose, the mouth, the nose, the mouth and nose. They're all the same color, they're all the same shape, which means they share that similar trait. Hmm. Their paws, it's hard to see this one's paws, but the mom's paws and this cub's paws, those look similar. They share that similar trait. I think some of these were pretty easy. What do you think? Are you ready for something more challenging? Yeah, I thought so. So, last but not least, I have two pictures of two dogs. Now we are talking about how offspring, or our baby animals, or humans, are similar, but not the exact same as the parents. Well, in order to really get a good look at what traits are similar and different, you need both parents. So here I have a picture of our special guests, mom and dad. Now you've probably guessed it by now, looking at these photos, our special guest is a pup, or Bella. Bella is my dog. She's a Bernadoodle. Now, on our pictures in front of us, you'll see a poodle. This is an apricot poodle, known for its brown coloring. And then this is a Bernese Mountain Dog. Now these were Bella's parents. You'll notice they look extremely different. One thing they do have in common though, is four legs. Two ears, a nose, a mouth, a tongue, and they're really cute. I don't think that's a trait though. We're gonna take a look at Bella in a little bit. But what I want us to do is look at what are some of the characteristics that we notice that are unique or special to these individual dogs. We'll start with the poodle. So the poodle is Bella's mother. She's an apricot standard poodle. Standard just means that she's the biggest size of poodle there is, the normal size. Now you might have heard of toy poodles or miniature poodles. Those are just smaller sizes of poodles. So looking at an apricot poodle, you'll notice she has brown or a slightly brown reddish fur. She really has hair. You may notice that her hair is curly. You may notice that her nose is a little bit longer than the Bernese Mountain Dog, comes out a little bit more. She has long ears and a long tail. And she is very, very fluffy. <laughs> now let's take a look at Bella's father. He's a Bernese Mountain Dog. Now you'll notice that the Bernese Mountain Dogs have different colors on them. He has a lot of black coloring, some brown up near his face and his legs. He has white on his chest, white on his face, and then white on his paws, if you can see that. You'll notice that his nose isn't as long as the poodle's nose. You'll notice that the mouth is similar between the two dogs. The eyes, if you look really carefully, you'll notice the poodle's eyes look a little bit bigger than the Bernese Mountain Dog. They're a little bit more set back. Now I wonder what these two, if they had a puppy or Bella, I wonder what their offspring would look like. Make some predictions now. What do you think Bella looks like? Bella is the offspring or the child of these two dogs. If you had to use your imagination right now, what kind of characteristics or traits do you think Bella would have? Do you think she's all one color, like the poodle? Do you think she's more than one color, like the Bernese Mountain Dog? Do you think she has curly hair? Or more straight fur? Do you think she has that longer nose, like the poodle? or the shorter nose, like the Bernese Mountain Dog. What traits do you think Bella has that are similar, but not the same, as the parents? I think it's time that we go get Bella. What do you think? Okay. Okay, scientists, this is Bella. Bella is a Bernadoodle. Yeah, aren't you? Yes, you are. 
she is the offspring or the baby, she's not so little anymore, of the Bernese Mountain Dog and the poodle that we looked at a couple minutes ago. Now taking a look at Bella, do you see any characteristics or traits that are similar between her and both the poodle and Bernese Mountain Dog? Let's take a look. Well, the first thing I notice is her nose. Her nose is really long, a lot like the poodle. Remember what that poodle looked like? The next thing I notice is her hair or her fur. You'll notice she's all different colors. There's some, if you look really close, there's some black hair, there's some brown hair, there's some white hair, which kind of makes her look gray in a few places. So she's all different colors, just like the Bernese Mountain Dog. Now something else that might be difficult to see, but hopefully you can see it, is her hair. She has hair just like the poodle. Now it's a little short because she got a haircut a couple weeks ago, but you get the point. You'll notice that some of her hair is kind of curly. You can see it in her ears. You can see it in her hair. You can see it on her side. She has curly hair. Can you do a spin for everyone? Can you spin? Can you spin? Good girl. So this is Bella. She's our special guest. Apparently she's a little camera shy right now. <laughs> but she is the offspring of the Bernese Mountain Dog and the Poodle. And you can see different characteristics or traits that are similar between Bella and both the Poodle and the Bernese Mountain Dog. That's how you and me got all of our traits or characteristics. I don't look just like my mom and I don't look just like my dad. I look like a combination of both of them. Do you see characteristics? Do you see traits that are similar between you and your mom? Or you and your dad? What about characteristics that are similar between all of you? What about characteristics that are different? When you get a chance, take a look. Find some characteristics. <laughs> While Bella chews on her leash. What are some characteristics that are similar between you and your mom? You and your dad? And if you even want to go further, what about your grandparents? Are there any characteristics or traits that you have that are similar between your grandma or grandpa? Because chances are there are some because your grandparents pass along traits to your parents and your parents pass along those traits to you. I'll see you next weekend, scientists. Thanks for hanging out. Kindergarten is great at Kansas City Public Schools. I know this, they have really good teachers. Uh, I know this is a great school. They teach them stuff that I thought my kids would never be able to know at the age of five. Since deciding to send our kiddos to a neighborhood school, we've become a, even more of a part of our community. Now is the time to enroll your future kindergartner for the new school year. Visit enrollkc.org today. I love Southeast because of the culture, the bank program, and restorative justice. I love Southeast because of the academic, sports, and students. I love Southeast because of the people, the energy, and the advanced classes. It's not a like. I love Southeast because the students here at Southeast are full of potential and they believe in achieving anything. We are, we are Southeast. 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 We stand. We stand. Shoulder to shoulder. shoulder, to shoulder. Join the Southeast family. Enroll today.
scientists, it's Jessica Power, Science Curriculum Coordinator at Kansas Public Schools. We are back for another session of science. Last week we talked about energy. We talked about energy transfer, we talked about how to make a solar oven, we talked about heat and the effects of heat from the sun. This week we're going to switch gears and talk about life science, which means it's a really good time to introduce you to my assistant. You probably noticed him last week just kind of sitting in the corner, not doing anything, but now's a good time to introduce you to Fred. Everyone, this is Fred. Fred, this is everyone. You're supposed to wave. He waves. <laughs> Fred is a model of a human skeleton. That means all of the bones that you see on Fred are bones that you have in your body and I have in my body. So for example, this bone right here is called his humerus. I know it's kind of humerus that's so called the humerus, but this isn't a joke. His humerus connects his shoulder so he can move it back and forth to his elbow, just like you. You have your humerus that goes from your shoulder to your elbow that allows you to move your arm around. Now Fred's not gonna do much. You may notice from time to time that he just holds my lab coat. That's really his only job, since that's really all he can do, because he's not alive. Okay, Fred, we'll see you later. Hang out, because <laughs> he's hanging. All right, scientists, we are gonna spend today talking about life science. Specifically, we're gonna talk about animal adaptations or different features or structures that animals have that are unique to them. Like us, we have thumbs. No thumbs move around. There's actually not very many animals on the planet that have a thumb like we do. Most animals don't have to grab things and use their hands like we do. So that's kind of special. Other primates have opposable thumbs as well. We're also gonna talk about today ecosystems and we're specifically gonna focus on food webs and food chains and ecosystems. We're gonna talk about producers or plants. We're gonna talk about consumers, animals that eat other things, plants, animals, or plants and animals. And then we're gonna see how all of that is connected into what we call a food web. Now we're gonna carry over a piece of information last week about energy transfer. Anytime an animal eats something, they're getting energy from their food. So for example, a rabbit that eats grass is getting energy from that grass. Now that grass got energy from the sun, which we talked about last week. It's all connected. So we're gonna have some friends from the Kansas City Zoo help us out. Unfortunately, they're not gonna be here live, but you can access these friends just like I'm going to access them. So we're actually gonna be talking a lot about penguins today. We're gonna talk about adaptations of penguins. We're gonna be talking about the environment that penguins live in, because they don't just live where it's cold. And we're gonna talk about how penguins fit into an ecosystem. Sound good? Let's get started. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make some observations about our penguin friends at the zoo. Now, if you wanna do this at home, you can go to the Kansas City Zoo website. There's a section for animals and you can cover over that section and you'll see where it says orangutan cam or penguin cam. Click on penguin cam and it will give you a live feed of the penguin habitat or enclosure at the Kansas City Zoo. You'll be able to see the water area, you'll be able to see the land parts that the penguins have, and you'll be able to see the penguins waddling around. Let's take a look, shall we? All right, we have a view of the penguins at the Kansas City Zoo. Can you see them? We got some that are just waddling about with their wings out. Ooh, this one's flapping. This one, just chilling. Just hanging out, taking a nap. Ooh, we've got a couple in the water. Do you see them swimming? Look at that. If you can look carefully, ooh, it dove down. But you'll notice that penguins use their wings as swimmers or as little fins in the ocean to help them move. Oh, there you go, you can see it fluttering. So even though penguins don't really fly, they use their wings to help them swim. Let's take a look. What do you notice about the color of the penguins? Hmm, make an observation. What do you notice about their color?
Yeah, the penguin's body on the bottom is white, but the back of the penguin is black. Do you know why that is? Any guesses? Anyone? Let me give you a clue. There's a penguin swimming here and there. Oh, there is one swimming back here and back here. Can you see him very well? Hmm. Why might the bottoms be white and the top be black? Yeah, that's camouflage. So the back of the penguins is a black color. And that's so that different organisms that may eat a penguin, like a large bird, can't see the penguin very well from the distance because it blends in with the dark color of the ocean. Now the bellies of the penguins have a white color to them. And that white color is so that when a ocean creature that maybe is looking up doesn't see the penguin at the surface of the water because the white belly blends in with the light from the sky. So it's just one way that penguins are camouflaged. Now it's not feeding time, unfortunately, so we don't have any penguins that are hungry or eating. Well, they might be hungry. <laughs> but fun fact about penguins, an adaptation or a structure, a special structure they have for survival is on their tongue, believe it or not. Penguins have little spikes on their tongue that help them to hold prey or food in their mouth. Now, most of the time when penguins are eating, they're getting their food from the ocean because they're eating krill. That krill can be really slippery and difficult to hold in their beak and hold in their mouth as they're swimming through the ocean. So they have those spikes to give some texture and to grip the krill so they don't fall out. Who knew that, right? Penguins have spikes in their mouths, on their tongues. Oof, can you imagine if we had that? I wonder what that would feel like. Probably not. Now, penguins also have a layer of fat in their body. Now, while as humans, we also have a layer of fat in our body, and that fat does the same job as a penguin's. However, the fat in the penguins is a little bit different. The fat in the penguin is to help insulate or keep the penguin warm. A penguin that lives in the Antarctica is always around extremely cold temperatures, and so it needs a way to help stay warm. So that fat layer, plus their feathers, allow them to keep insulated or warm. Now their feathers are super short and really dense. That means there's a lot of feathers in a really small area. Think of it as layers. They have lots and lots of layers of feathers. So those feathers, along with that fat layer, help to keep the penguin warm. So those are just some adaptations or structures that penguins have to help them stay alive and be able to survive in their ecosystem in Antarctica. Now Galapagos penguins that live on the island outside of Ecuador, they have a few different features or adaptations that allow them to live in a more tropical or warmer environment. But for today, we are just sticking to the Antarctic penguins. Okay. Let's keep moving. Let's talk about how these penguins are in their ecosystems. What do these penguins eat? What eats these penguins? Let's find out. Don't you just love penguins? They're so interesting. I think part of the reason is because we don't have penguins here in Kansas City. So it's real fun to watch them waddle around and observe their behaviors in the enclosure that represents their habitat. Now at the very beginning of our session, I mentioned that penguins live in many different places. We typically think of penguins living in cold areas, like Antarctica. But did you know there's also penguins that live in what's called the Galapagos Islands? The Galapagos Islands are an island area just off the coast of Ecuador in South America. Speaking of South America, South America is in the Southern Hemisphere. Penguins live in every continent on the Southern Hemisphere. So that would include South America, Antarctica, Australia, that was really warm in there, and Africa. Yes, there are penguins that live in Africa. They live on the very, very Southern tip down in South Africa. Anyways, we're gonna focus today on our Antarctic penguins. Those are the penguins that live in Antarctica. Now there's several different types of animals or species that live in Antarctica. It is one of the smaller ecosystems in the world, 
but it's still really interesting. Now, believe it or not, um, penguins eat shrimp or krill. They eat really, really tiny, small organisms because penguins really aren't that big either. Now, we talked about adaptations and how penguins have those spikes in their tongue to help hold in that prey because sometimes things are slippery when they're wet. Now, let's talk about what else eats food in Antarctica. Behind me, I have a model of a food chain and a food web. Both of those are models or representations of what eats what in an ecosystem. So let's start with the food chain. You've probably seen a food chain, a row of organisms, plants and animals, with some arrows in them. This is a single line of organisms or species in an ecosystem and how they eat. So for example, phytoplankton is a plant that lives in the ocean. Phytoplankton is eaten by krill. Krill are really small organisms that are similar to shrimp. Krill get eaten by seals. Now there's a lot of different kind of seals, so I kind of just lumped them all together. But for now, seals eat krill. Now seals, they're not at the top of the food chain. Seals are eaten by whales, specifically smaller toothed whales. That means whales that just have smaller teeth compared to larger whales, okay? So again, let's go through this. A food chain shows a single line of species or organisms that live in an ecosystem that follows a chain of food being eaten. So let's break this down in terms of energy. So phytoplankton, those are plants. Those plants get their energy from the sun. Yes, they still can get energy from the sun even though they're in the ocean and water. Now those phytoplankton take in that sun's energy. And then along comes some krill and they start eating the phytoplankton. Now the krill have just received or obtained, taken in that energy, once from the sun, that the phytoplankton had. Now, do you think the krill are getting greater than, less than, or equal to the amount of energy the phytoplankton took from the sun? Think about it. The krill, are they getting equal to, greater than, or less than the amount of energy the phytoplankton received from the sun? Think about it. Think about it. Got an answer? What do you got? If you said less than, you're right on target. You're right. Every animal in the food chain receives less and less energy from the sun compared to the phytoplankton. So the phytoplankton took the most energy from the sun. Then some of that energy, the krill eats. Some of that energy, again, the seal eats. And then some of that energy, the whale gets. You may notice that the farther up the food chain you get, sometimes have bigger diets or eat more things so that they can get more energy. Something else you notice as you go up a food chain is that your last animal, this last consumer, is a predator. And that predator is almost always a carnivore. Carnivores are animals that eat only meat. So humans, we're not carnivores because we eat more than just meat. Go back to the beginning. Phytoplankton, plants, they're producers because they produce their own energy, energy they get from the sun. Then you have these consumers in the middle and your consumers can eat only plants. So our krill only eat phytoplankton. That's all they eat is plants. They're considered herbivores. Things, other organisms like rabbits are also herbivores. They only eat plants. Moving up the food chain, you have some species that eat plants and animals. They're what we call omnivores. So they will eat phytoplankton, but they'll also eat krill. So we could draw another arrow to the seal from the phytoplankton, but that's not how food chains work. We'll get there. And finally, we have our whale. As I said, those are carnivores. So they eat only meat. So they're eating the seal not the phytoplankton. Okay, 
Now, ecosystems are not this simple. Ecosystems aren't just a chain or a line of animals and plants. Ecosystems are more complex. And so a lot of times scientists use food webs to better understand the feeding patterns or feeding relationships in an ecosystem. Our definition of a food web is a model that shows all feeding relationships among living things in an, organ, in an ecosystem. All feeding patterns. So a food web takes all the living organisms in an ecosystem and shows you exactly what eats what and what's being eaten. Now I picked an Antarctic ecosystem because compared to other ecosystems, it's really small. If I was to put a food web of a rainforest in here, there'd be like three to four times as many animals. In fact, rainforests have thousands of species of plants, thousands. I didn't have enough room for that. So let's take a look at the Antarctic food web and see where our penguins fit in. These poor little penguins. Let's take a look. So once again, we have phytoplankton and we have krill, and those pretty much sit at the bottom of our food chain, food web, excuse me. So we have our plants, lots of phytoplankton, because lots of animals are eating the phytoplankton. We have our krill. As you can imagine, there's a lot of krill in the ocean. There's a lot of things that eat krill. Then we move up to our next level. You'll see birds, seals, fish, penguins, and squid. Now you'll notice that there's arrows pointing at those animals. Those arrows represent what's eating. So that means birds are what's eating with this arrow. Birds are eating krill. Now unfortunately for the birds in this arrow, the seals are eating the birds. So you can follow the food web by where the arrows are going to determine what animal is eating. Now if we take a look, we have our plants, we have our herbivore. Now along here, you have some herbivores, or sorry, you have some carnivores and some omnivores. Typically, you're only gonna have a few carnivores in your ecosystem. A lot, a lot of herbivores, or only plant-eating animals, and some omnivores that eat both. So, keep moving. If we go up to our predators, or our carnivores, you will notice I have two animals at the top, the baleen whale and then the smaller toothed whale. So there's a lot of different whales in that category. Now only one of these animals eats, but is not eaten. Take a look. Only one of these animals eats, but is not eaten. You see which one it is? Yeah, it's the smaller toothed whales. You probably noticed because all of the arrows related to the smaller toothed whale are pointing at the whale. So our whale is our top of the food hierarchy or order of the Antarctic ecosystem. It's eating a lot of stuff, but nothing's eating it. So, Adaptations are characteristics that different organisms have in order to survive in the areas they live in. Now, all of those areas they live in are very different. There's several different types of ecosystems. The Antarctic ecosystem is a type of tundra. Tundra just means that it's really dry, so there's not a lot of rain, and there typically isn't very many trees. We probably haven't been to Antarctica, I wish we could. That'd be really fun just to take a trip, all of us together, to go learn about the Antarctic ecosystem. But if you were to go to Antarctica, you're not going to see any trees. You're not going to see any rain. You're going to see a bunch of ice. Ice and snow and some rock. Another type of ecosystem, very different 
from the Antarctic ecosystem is the tropical rainforest. The tropical rainforest, the biggest, is found in South America and that's called the Amazon rainforest. You may have heard of the Amazon rainforest. In fact, the Amazon rainforest had a really, really big wildfire last year and some parts of it are still burning. Every time a wildfire hits, that destroys part of an ecosystem. And when you destroy part of an ecosystem, when you destroy the habitat, and you even destroy the animals. We can talk about that in another episode. Let's just stick to the types of ecosystems right now. You also have desert ecosystems. You can think of like Southwest America, like Arizona, New Mexico. It's very dry, very hot, lots of cacti. It's plural for cactus. You have a lot of reptiles that like that heat. That's a desert ecosystem. You have other ecosystems too, like a forest, like we have here in Missouri or the grasslands that's more flat with just lots and lots of tall grass. And then you also have down in like Africa, you have the savanna. Savanna is similar to a grassland, but the animals that you find here in the prairie grasslands in the Midwest are very different from the animals that you find in the savanna in Africa. So that's just an idea of some types of ecosystems. I encourage you to go do some investigating and check out the food webs for some different kinds of ecosystems. If this seems like an easy ecosystem to understand for a food web, go check out the tropical rainforest. Go check out the savanna. Find an area that interests you and learn more about it. Learn more about the ecosystem. What's the habitat like? What types of plants do you find there? What types of animals? And then once you've done that and learned about the ecosystem, Next, learn about the feeding relationships. So learn about the food chains. And then you can identify a couple animals that you're most interested in in those ecosystems and you can learn about their adaptations, like a leopard, for example, in the savanna, going from really cold to really hot. Now, the leopard in savanna, in the savanna, actually is able to climb and jump from tree to tree. It's camouflaged with all of its spots on its body, which helps it blend into its surroundings so its prey can't see it coming. Now zebras, as odd as zebras might be, black and white striped, they actually blend into their surroundings as well as prey. So zebras are also camouflaged so that predators can't locate them. So go take a look, go do some research, go learn about some ecosystems, they're fascinating. Thanks for tuning in and have a great day. I chose manual because it's challenging and fun and it can help me with college. I chose manual because I wanted to get a jump start in my career with culinary arts. I chose manual to acquire skills I'd use in real life. I chose manual because I want to be an ER doctor and being an EMT is my first step. Kickstart your future today at Manual Career and Technical Center. Manual is open for all 11th and 12th grade students in both Kansas and Missouri. Learn more today at enrollkc.org slash manual or call 816-418-5200. The desire to create lives within each of us. From Grammy-winning producers and musicians, to NBA stars, to Navy admirals and Medal of Honor recipients, to internationally renowned artists and beloved local muralists, Paseo graduates have been creating their own success, their own history, their own legacy since 1926. Now it's your time. Create your future at Paseo Academy of Fine and Performing Arts. Learn more at enrollkc.org Paseo. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, and it's Dr. Jones again. Uh, let's pick up our conversation from last week when we were talking about pH acids and bases. So, if you recall, if you're looking at the pH scale, we're only concerned with the hydrogen ion concentration. And here's what we're saying. The more hydrogen you have, the more acidic a solution is. The less hydrogen you have, the more basic. So that's all great, fine and dandy, but what does that have to do with what happens out in nature or what happens out in the real world? 
So one of the things I want to talk to you about is how acids not only react with bases, but how they react with metals. Because that's one of the things about an acid that gives it such unique properties. So here's what we have here. We have three different types of metal. This first metal is iron. And this is really what iron looks like. This one is uh, magnesium. If you notice, magnesium has a completely different consistency, a completely different shape and properties than our iron. This is zinc. And a lot of people think about zinc, they think about, oh, aren't those supplements that I add into uh, vitamins? Yes, there are <laughs> zinc supplements. But this is what the metal actually looks like. And then the last one we have here is copper. So we have some copper beads. Now, one thing about acids, all acids are not created equally. Here's what I'm talking about. So, this is hydrochloric acid, okay? And one of the things that is unique about hydrochloric acid is that it is considered to be a strong acid. Here's what I mean. pH paper is a easy way of being able to figure out where an acid or base falls on this scale. Okay, so if you're looking at this, uh, most acids and bases are clear. So by looking at them just with your eyes, you can't tell exactly where they fall on the scale. However, if I take and dip the pH paper into an acid, I can quickly see where it is. And if you notice, wow, this is very acidic. So for hydrochloric acid, we're talking about something that has a pH of 1. pH of 1 is way down here, very acidic, almost like gastric acid, okay? Now, this other acid that I have here is called um, acetic acid, all right? Acids in the name, however, like I said, all acids aren't the same. So if we're looking at acetic acid, okay? Notice acetic acid has a pH somewhere around, eh, somewhere between 4 and 5. So it is not as acidic as our hydrochloride. So think of it being somewhere here, like around orange juice or lemon juice, okay? And just to like round things off, this is sodium hydroxide. So by the name, you can already tell, wait a minute, something's a little different. Well, sodium hydroxide has different properties than both our acetic acid and our hydrochloric acid. And those properties tend to align with da, 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 bases. This is like a 1314. So if we're looking at 1314, we're up here. We're like around uh, soapy water or bleach. Okay, and so again, one thing that's great about pH paper is it kind of tells you where your solution falls, but it also gives you an idea of how strong it is. So let's look at our two acids and how they react with metals. So first of all, I'm going to start with our weaker of the two, our acetic acid. So think of this as orange juice, lemon juice. Okay, so we're going to add it first to our Again, this is our iron. Then we're going to add it to our magnesium, our zinc, and finally our copper. Okay? Going to work those around and see if we see any reactivity. Now, if you notice, you're getting bubbles with the magnesium. You're getting a few bubbles with the zinc, but there's like nothing happening with the copper or with the um, iron. We would call that a definite reaction, but with the other two metals, not so much, okay? Now, let's try our hydrochloric acid. violent reaction. So 
So, notice, hydrochloric acid reacted very similar to the acetic acid. However, it was a more violent, a more robust reaction. And here's why. The big difference between our hydrochloric and our acetic acid was the amount of hydrogen ions. Basically, think of it this way. If I gave you a hundred bucks and said, yeah, go to the mall or go online, do your worst damage. You're not really going to be able to do a whole lot of damage. I mean, hundred dollars can't get much. But if I gave you 10 grand and said, go crazy, you could do a lot of damage with $10,000 and no limits. That's the 10. This is the hundred. Same thing. When you have a stronger acid, you can do more damage, which is why if you look at what gastric acid can do compared to like orange juice, this stuff breaks down food. Orange juice, yeah, burn your eyes, but eh, not too much beyond that. Now, let's try something though. Let's look at our base. Here we go. Sodium hydroxide. What does sodium hydroxide do with metals? Well, does it do anything to... uh? Our iron? Nope. Did it do anything to our magnesium? Nope. Did it do anything to our zinc? Nope. Did it do anything to our copper? No. Well, why not? Well, think about it. Yeah, it's a strong base, but it doesn't have very many hydrogen ions. So although, yeah, this is a very strong base, it's a weak, weak, weak acid. So it had no reactivity, whereas our acids did. So that's the main reason why when you're looking at a pH scale, you have to think about, well, what is it that is going to actually react with the metal or with the skin? Okay. Now, one more thing. How can you use a base to neutralize an acid. Well, let me show you. So here are three solutions. One, so, uh, hydrochloric acid. Two, acetic acid. Three, sodium hydroxide. This is another kind of indicator. It's called uh, phenethylene. And what it does is, if you're in an acid, it doesn't really do a whole lot. In a base, turns pink. So basically, this will tell you when you've taken an acid and turned it into a base. So watch. And a couple more drops, a couple more drops. So let's compare. Here is my sodium hydroxide. Let's add a drop of sodium hydroxide to our acetic acid. That's one. Wow. Immediate reaction. Let's add it to our hydrochloric acid. Immediate reaction. But watch this. You spin this, it becomes clear. You spin this, it also becomes clear. There's this thing called titration, which is like a balance. When you titrate, you basically add enough base to neutralize an acid. So let's do... 10 drops. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 drops. Let's see what happens. Goes back to being clear. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 drops. Ah, 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 ah. Yeah. I've watched too much of the count. 18 drops, nothing. 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 23 drops. Oh, oh, oh. Now, notice, 23 drops. Oh, okay, we got something. Watch this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 1 from 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6 to 7 to 8 to 9 30. 30 drops. Spin it. Goes back to being clear. Basically, it's going to take more of this base 
to neutralize this acid than it would to neutralize this acid. So, case in point, if you have baking soda versus having soap in your eyes, you'll be able to flush the baking soda out easier than the soap. Why? Well, because it's closer to being neutral, being like water, okay? Same thing. If I have tomato juice versus lemon juice, the tomato juice will be easier to neutralize than the lemon juice, okay? So again, two things I wanna bring home. First of all, all acids aren't the same. Some are more acidic than others. What makes an acid acidic? The amount of hydrogen ions. Bases, although they may be very, very strong, don't have as many hydrogens. So what may react with an acid won't react with a base. And more important, if I have an acid and I want to neutralize it, I can neutralize it with a base. But if the acid is strong, it's going to take more of a base to neutralize it. I hope this helps you guys with your understanding of why acids and bases are so important to us in science. Have a great day. Kindergarten is great at Kansas City Public Schools. I know this, they have really good teachers. Uh, I know this is a great school. They teach them stuff that I thought my kids would never be able to know at the age of five. Since deciding to send our kiddos to a neighborhood school, we've become a, even more of a part of our community. Now is the time to enroll your future kindergartner for the new school year. Visit enrollkc.org today.